a faculty meeting, and I begged off, and they're all still over there. And I am honored I'd rather be with you. What can I say? <laughs> Just don't tell. Oh, over there, I say the opposite. No, no, no. <laughs> well, um, this subject is huge, as you doubtless know. And my um, desire today is actually to uh, make only one point. But uh, before I make that one point, I want to offer a few preliminary observations, to offer a few perspectives. Um, and then I'm going to make one point and flesh it out in a variety of ways. First of all, some historical perspective. On the one hand, it is useful to remember those instances in history when the gospel has so been promulgated, lived out, that huge transformations in society have taken place. In uh, 1740, in London, uh, on Easter Sunday, there were precisely six people who showed up for Holy Communion at St. Paul's Cathedral. That's merely a measure of how far down any form of Christianity had slumped. There were 280 crimes on the books that were capital punishments, including stealing a loaf of bread. Slavery was rising in the empire. The Industrial Revolution was in pretty good swing, and kids as young as four and five were being sent down the lines to get out of the cold, sent to dangerous factories from the age of five and six. Debtors' prisons were such that you could be thrown into jail for debt, and when you were in jail, they didn't feed you or anything. So unless people came and gave you food, you could actually starve to death in debt for prison. And so inevitably, it was quite a lot of social strife, and probably the UK wasn't all that far from a bloody revolution, which is, after all, what uh, took place half a century later in France. But in 1734, God raised up a young Welshman by the name of Howell Harris, who began preaching the gospel in Wales. 1738, George Whitfield began to preach to coal miners outside the uh, uh, coal stations, uh, especially in Bristol area. 1740, John Wesley started preaching, and so forth. And in a singularly remarkable movement of God, Methodism in its various phases particular Methodism, general Methodism, and so on, uh, continued a fair bit of vibrancy, theological orthodoxy, and social transformation for a period of about 60 years. Now there were some deaths, of course. Some years <coughs> left, some, some died, moved on, and so forth. But nevertheless, it really was quite remarkable. And out of this came, first of all, for example, the abolition of the slave trade across the Atlantic, and eventually the abolition of slavery in the Empire. But it also came the first child labor laws, the beginnings of the first trade unions, the beginnings of the first safety laws, the beginnings of the first steps toward compulsory education, and all, all kinds of things. And uh, they climaxed in British history in what is called the 1832 Great Reform Bill, where there was a, a bevy of, of uh, uh, changes that were brought up to the Westminster Parliament. What's well, a nice success story we like to talk about? Now, a negative story. In this country, um, some form of confessionalism, with ups and downs and various uh, flavors, both good and bad, predominated in the, 19, in the 1800s, the 19th century. Um, but from about 1880 on, um, in some denominations a little earlier, some denominations a little later, there comes to be more and more of a bifurcation such that um, there is a kind of optimism connected with um, a, a, a Christian hope and perspective. Christianity is almost indifferentiable from getting a decent education, being nice to your neighbor, and, and so on. And eventually, it produced what came to be called the fundamentalist modernist split. Oh, well, don't forget that at the time, fundamentalism didn't have any of the negative overtones that it has in some circles today. It meant that people were wanting to hang on to the fundamentals of the faith. And, um, that split developed in a variety of ways, such that by the time we got to 1930, or there was roughly the same spread of time that the Evangelical Awakening occupied in Britain, by the time we got to that point, 
then uh, at least in the leadership of the mainline churches, not so much in the local churches, but in the leadership of the mainline churches, uh, the gospel was very heavily identified with social transformation, but it was hard to find much supernatural Christianity left. And to some extent, um, almost by way of inverse reaction, that you, you, you did get some people so strongly proclaiming the gospel that they tended to downplay the importance of doing good to one's neighbor and so on. Uh, the latter tendency, however, was not nearly as stronger as the former. That is the tendency in the liberal side, just to downplay um, confessional Christianity. Now let me come to the present tendency to stereotype. Many uh, today who are becoming interested in the interrelationship of the gospel to broader, broader doing mercy type deeds um, tend to run the stereotypes like this. The previous generation came down either on the social transformation side or on gospel fidelity side, and we want to put together both. Now, I urge you not to adopt that stereotype as your background. Number one, although there is this history, you know, from 1880 to 1930, there's something of it there, there's some of it there. Nevertheless, nevertheless, detailed studies have been done both in the UK and the United States to examine what groups are actually doing the work, even in secular relief organizations, like Oxfam, or um, UNICEF, or whatever. And both countries have come out with very strong statistics to demonstrate, in fact, that conservative Christians are doing a vastly disproportionate amount of the work on the ground in both of those organizations. In this country, you can find a lot of those studies at the website of the Acton Institute, and there are corresponding sources that I could tell you about in the UK. Um, in other words, the stereotype doesn't work very well actually on the ground. And I come from a conservative Christian home you know, that, that could easily be identified in some sense with an earlier fundamentalism. I thought was a church and the pastor. He believed the gospel, we were brought up with the gospel in a cross cultural situation in French Canada and all the rest. And if you told him that he wasn't concerned about the social needs of people, he would look at you as if he uh, was wondering what planet you were from. I, I don't know how many down and others we had in our home. <laughs> they seemed to be crawling over the place. Um, for years and years and years, my father was on the, the board of an orphanage. There were some funds there, giving money there, helping out there. I remember going up with him to the orphanage to help out and so on. And when he died, he didn't have much money. But when he died, a very substantial part of his money, before the rest of it was divided equitably amongst his three children, a very substantial part went to charitable things, which included, yes, local church, some mission organizations, also the American Cancer Society, an orphanage, and so on. I mean, there's far more integration in these people of another generation than you sometimes realize. Do not get yourself in a place where you're thinking self-righteously about those who have come before. It's so easy for any generation to start saying, they did it this way wrong and this way wrong, but we've got it right. It's just too easy. Don't go down that route. Well, means do your best to get it right yourself, but, but, but avoid ca pa uh, 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 casting what you're trying to do on the background of a stereotype in which everybody else has got it wrong. It's not good for you spiritually, and historically it's not very fair either. That's my first preliminary point. The second um, preliminary observation is that there are um, organizations today which, in their statements of faith, um, are recognizing <coughs> that commitments turn on more than statements of faith, but also on visions of ministry. Let's take a conservative denomination like the PCA. Presbyterian Church of America. I'm picking on them just for convenience sake because they don't have a dozen others. Their doctrinal standards are the Westminster Confession, the Westminster Standards. And um, uh, there is no longer more detailed statement of faith anywhere in the world, to my knowledge. Nevertheless, within the PCA, there are churches which temperamentally, stylistically, in terms of heart alignment, are tied up with, let's say, the banner of truth approach to uh, Christian confessionalism and promulgation. 
and there are others that are tightly allied to the kind of thing that Tim Keller is doing in New York City. And there are others that are tightly allied to half a dozen other kinds of things. In other words, there, there are some who would call themselves emerging, and there were some who would call themselves very definitely anti-emerging, and so forth. In other words, even when you have a pretty tight statement of faith like the Westminster Confession, it's surprising how much diversity you can actually get at the local church level. Those are the realities. And therefore, one of the, one of the reasons why when we put together the Gospel Coalition, we established not merely a statement of faith, but what we call the foundation documents. We included, in addition to a preamble, and a pretty detailed and robust statement of faith, what we call a theological vision of ministry where we try to work out from the statement of faith to what it means in terms of how we conceive ministry to be. Uh, now, I'll return to that in a few moments, but you can look at those documents for yourself online. Simply go to The Gospel Coalition, don't forget the the, thegospelcoalition.org, and then click Foundation Documents. And it's, they're there in about 10 or 15 languages, too. So you can, you can pick them up and, and, and read them for yourself. Um, and you'll see what I mean by the kind of integration to which I'm going to refer in a few minutes. Now then, that's all by way of introduction. Let me uh, now make my main point. The fundamental issue, I think, conceptually, not necessarily the fundamental issue about how we use our time, that's related, but it's a differentiable feature. The fundamental issue conceptually, as we think about this, is not only what we're doing, but how we configure the undergirding structure of thought. Let me repeat that and then explain. The fundamental issue is not only what we are doing with our time, with our priorities, with our money, with our imaginations, but how we configure the undergirding structure of thought. Now, let, let me uh, explain what I mean by that and then offer something of a preliminary resolution. When I was first approached uh, to speak to this group, um, part of the memo that was sent to me said, Faith Alive is a group that has a desire to engage in discussion about social justice issues and discuss how compassion and justice ministries are part and parcel of the gospel. Now, if the document had said how faith and justice issues or compassion and justice ministries and issues are part and parcel of biblical mandates, I wouldn't have raised an eyebrow. When you say they're part and parcel of, the parcel of the gospel, then I want to know what people think the gospel is and how you find out. Let me go further. Uh, McLaren, in uh, two or three of his books, has argued, for example, that an essential part of the gospel is what Jesus makes out to be the first and second commandment. Love God with heart and soul and mind and strength. Second commandment, and your neighbor as yourself. That is the gospel. Not all of the gospel, but it is a very substantial part of the gospel. I was uh, talking to, I was interviewing for a particular job, um, some, some a Christian leader who uh, was asked what he understood the gospel to mean. He said, well, there's, there's a gospel about uh, Jesus Christ and him crucified and saving us and so on. And there's a social gospel and we listen to a few others. Um, and even the equip, the, 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 the moniker, the, the category of transformation of self and society brings with it a whole nest of related questions that are at the definitional level. Well, let me back off and just wander through the definitional issues. Number one, what is the gospel and how will you find out about it? Is the gospel simply anything that you think is mandated by scripture? In which case, loving your neighbors yourself is part of the gospel. Is that what the gospel is? How do you find it? There are essentially, if you're going to be biblical, two ways of finding what the gospel is. One is 
to look up every single instance of the word gospel and related words to gospelize, often to preach good news or something like that in the, in the modern English. And examine the context and so far as you can determine what the content is. And then second, to fit that understanding within the broad framework of the Bible's entire storyline from beginning to end. That's the discipline of biblical theology. Because you see, what is at issue at the conceptual level? What is at issue at the conceptual level is how you establish the pattern of biblical thought. If you think that everything is biblical, provided you can attach a proof text, well, then, of course, Mormons are biblical. Jehovah's Witnesses are biblical. Those who want to discount any attachment to social justice issues are biblical. Those who want to pour all of their eggs into that basket are biblical. I mean, how do you establish what is biblical? My point is that, conceptually, how we configure the undergirding structure of thought in the Bible is absolutely paramount. It's absolutely paramount. So you can find teachers and preachers, for example, who will choose a text here and a text there and a text somewhere else and say some true things about it and say some absolutely ridiculous things about it and you can't tell the difference. Because they're saying some things about this text which actually flat out contradict other themes within the same biblical book, let alone within the whole canon. And they don't have the pattern of how the whole thing gets together. Did you see? So, the question returns, how do you establish what the gospel is? What is the gospel? And then I would say that the very meaning of gospel is news, great news, often good news, but great news that is to be proclaimed. That's what it is. And however you load the details, it's good news about what God has done, is doing, and especially through Christ. That's the good news. Now, that means that biblically, the force of what the gospel is is going to turn on God's coming to us in human form in the incarnation. And as Paul says, as a matter of first importance, that his expression, Christ died for sinners, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it's all about how God has taken initiative to reconcile rebels to himself for time and for eternity. And when you take a look at context after context after context after context, that's where the gospel focuses. When you have the gospel of the kingdom, an expression that shows up especially in the synoptic gospels, then you likewise have to work through what is meant by kingdom, what is entailed in it in terms of uh, 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 God's invading reign, what is meant by that, how it comes now and is con consummated later, what the structure of its ethics looks like and so on. But, but it is bound up with God's saving, transforming reign that is ultimately consummated at the end. It's good news about what God is actively doing. That is why historically, in the second place, many, many, many thoughtful theologians across the centuries have been driven to distinguish between the gospel and the effects of the gospel. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you only preach the gospel. If you preach the whole counsel of God, then you have to preach not only what the good news is, but how it works out in people's lives. So there is a place for saying some important things about both the first and second command. There is an important place for reminding ourselves of passages like Galatians 6, do good to all people, and especially those of the household of God. Or coming to Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, where the question is asked, who is my neighbor? And he responds with a story which eventually tells you not who is your neighbor, but to whom are you the neighbor? It is important to say all of those things. All of those things are bound up fundamentally with fidelity to the whole counsel of God. No argument there. But nevertheless, the pattern of sound, of sound teaching, that's a phrase excuse me, from Paul in 1 Timothy. Sorry, in 2 Timothy 1. The pattern of sound teaching is, in fact, careful to distinguish between the gospel, the good news about what God has done, with its effects in all kinds of ways. So, if you say, I'd like to give you my testimony, and you talk about what a robber you were before you became a Christian, and 
then you trusted Jesus and everything turned over and felt a lot better and, and you, you started loving people more and then on and on and on and on and on. Uh, have you preached the gospel? Not even close. <clears throat> You've talked about the effects of the gospel in your own life. But you haven't talked about the gospel. The gospel is about what God has done. It's about what Jesus has done. Do you, you see? You can give your testimony in such a way that you might allude briefly off in the distance somewhere to the gospel and never actually talk about the gospel. Or supposing then you want to start something that really helps transform local schools. Is this gospel ministry? Not if you're going to use gospel in any sense in which it's used in the New Testament. Quite frankly, not. If, on the other hand, you mean part of the effects of the gospel is doing good because we have been transformed and we care for other people who made in the image of God and so on, and therefore we ought to be doing this kind of thing, I'm happy. But if you try to say that it's gospel ministry, what the long-term effect tends to be is to lose what the New Testament says is the gospel. Eventually the gospel gets so diluted that it becomes a kind of Christianized moralism and nothing more. Now I'll come back to my historical examples with which I began. Let's come back to the Great Awakening. Did you see the film Amazing Grace? You like it? On several fronts it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Even picking up some one-liners of John Newton. I know only two things. I am grace and Christ is grace. And he said that. He was made out to be a bit of a wimp in his old age. That wasn't quite accurate. But nevertheless, there were some great lines in there. Do you know what was wrong with the film? Wrong from beginning to end. For anybody who's read the primary documents or read any decent biography of Wilberforce, for example. The whole thing was cast as either Wilberforce was going to enter into vocational ministry and preach and stuff like that, or he was going to free the slaves. And even good old Newton said that in his case he ought to do the latter. So all of the rest of his life then is pictured as, oh, there might be some Christianized stuff that's presupposed in the background, but freeing the slaves thus is the gospel for him. Historically, that is international class rubbish of the very first order. He was a gospel person all his life. He, he had two hours of devotions with his family in the morning. Uh, two, two chapters, rather, of devotions, with half an hour, 40 minutes of devotions with his family every morning. And, and he had two more chapters of the Bible, Bible reading at night. He preached the gospel on the streets and was diligent in, in evangelism all his life. A member of the local church was heavily invested in the fledgling Sunday school movement. He was a church and gospel person, powerful, all of his life. That's what drove him. Moreover, he did not become monophobic even about slavery. He pushed on slavery all his life, he did. He was also very instrumental in the lead-up to the Great Reform Bill of 1832, which addressed all kinds of matters in the minds. Of he wasn't a monophobic one kind of person who then gets blessed with a gospel approval at the end. One of the things that was so stunning about the impact of the Great Awakening on the social face of Britain was that almost all the leaders were powerful, Gospel committed people in the New Testament sense of gospel. They were preaching what God had done in Christ Jesus. They were preaching what Christ had achieved on the cross. They were preaching the power of the resurrection to transform people. They were demanding that people repent and believe. They were starting, in the case of Wesley, his Methodist societies with the little groups of 12 and local configurations and leadership and discipleship and Bible training and so on. Wesley put together, even while he was writing letters about slavery, he put together his 50 essential books for any fledgling preacher that everybody had to read if they were going to be on any of his circuits, and on and on and on. And all of those books had to do with what the Bible teaches and what the gospel is. So to have come to any of those people and said, is freeing the slaves the gospel? They would have laughed in your face. But it doesn't mean they weren't doing it. Because they made a fairly straightforward, fairly simple, but pretty rigid distinction between the gospel as defined by Scripture, the announcement of what God has done, this good news, this great news of what God has done in Christ Jesus, and the inevitable transforming effects of the gospel as they work out. Now you've got to preach both. 
but you'll confuse the two. Because if you confuse the two, the inevitable result is not the Whitfield Wesley awakening. It's 1880 to 1930, which I described a few moments ago, in which you get a dilution and dilution and dilution until you really have no gospel. Now, there are entailments to that, all kinds of entailments. When we worked on the foundation documents for uh, the Gospel Coalition, <coughs> the statement of faith that I mentioned, and the theological vision of ministry, when we worked on it, I drafted the statement of faith. Tim Keller drafted um, the theological vision of ministry. We compared notes and criticized each other. Then we brought them to the whole room, and for two whole annual sets of meetings, two sets of two days. We had these 50 guys going around, why, 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 taking them apart, criticizing them, teaching them, etc. But out of them came documents that were much stronger, much stronger. And one of the changes that was made consistently in the theological vision, say, theological vision of ministry, say, you can look at it online, as I said, look it up yourself. Instead of allowing us to say something like, we are concerned to save people's souls, and also to help them, help reduce suffering in this life. Instead, it would say something like, I should have brought in a document and read you some examples, but you can read them for yourself. There's scores of examples in the document. We are concerned to save people for time and eternity, and to reduce suffering both in this world and in the world to come. Because if you make a bifurcation at that point, so that you're reducing suffering only has to do with this life, then somehow you don't see the danger of the suffering in the next life. What does Jesus say? Don't be afraid of him who can destroy your body and afterwards can do nothing. Fear him rather, who after destroying body casts body and soul into hell. Fear him, I say. Now don't misunderstand. That does not mean that you therefore have the right to go out and just save souls, get people out of hell. But don't care if they starve to death. Don't care if there's social injustice. I'm not saying any of that. But I'm saying equally that it's not Christian to be very concerned to make sure they get enough food in their tummy and never talk about Jesus and the gospel. Get them fat before you send them to hell. You have to see what the issues are here. You will not preserve the gospel. You will not. Unless you see that the fundamental issue is how men and women are rightly reconciled to God for time and eternity and what it means in perfect consummation. You will not. So for those who come from a background where they think being faithful to the gospel has no bearing on social transformation or witness or human goods or whatever, then it's very helpful to read Tim Keller's essay, the lead essay, in the last fascicle of Thamelios. Thamelios is a student theological journal. It's now entirely digital, and it's on the website of the Gospel Coalition. Uh, that journal had about 200,000 hits in the last six months of 2008. Everything's downloadable there for free. Go and look up uh, volume 33, issue three. And the lead essay is only 11 pages, and Tim Keller has made a good and a strong and a sensitive case for Christians being involved in what he calls deeds of mercy, acts of mercy, as anybody I know. But he doesn't do it at the expense of the gospel, or he doesn't do it by using the gospel label to cover the world. Because of the long haul, the net effect is mere moralism, which never finally saves. So for somebody who comes along and is formally orthodox, then whether in their own life or in the social structure in which they live, I want to ask some questions. How has your putative trust in Christ as the one who has borne your sin and has bequeathed his spirit to you, how does it transform how you love your spouse? What you do with your money? What do you care for neighbors? And for some people, that's going to be more active roles in other kinds of things, too. As I told you, my father was involved in orphanages and things like that. 
or it might be involved in gathering money, going on the med for a while, with Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, doctors of the voyage and stuff. And, and all kinds of things. Like that. There's no limit to possibility. So, for example, one of our council members on the coalition, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you his name and the name of the church, I don't know why, because some of his story is actually on our website as well, from an earlier, an earlier workshop that we met. His name is Sandy Wilson. He's pastor of Second Prez in Memphis. Memphis probably has the worst school district of a considerable class <coughs> in America. 25% um, of the kids in the high school system there have been involved with these. 30,000 kids of 120,000. And a lot of the kids in a strong church like Seven Press don't go to the public system. It's not worth it. Lots of Christian schools around and so on and so on. But Sandy eventually went to the um, district suit, the district superintendent, and, and, and asked, Is there anything we can do? I mean, what, what, what can we do now? He said, I've got to tell you frankly, not many of our families even use the school system. But is there something we can do to help? She was an African American woman who was a Christian, and simply said to him, "Do you love children?" The first step in the partnership that developed was this church, which is several thousand strong, some more, adopted one of the larger local schools. By adopted, they made sure that the buildings were painted, there were enough school supplies. The loft, of the playgrounds picked up of glass. It was, it was cleaned up just physically. They put in some muscle power and some money into it, and so on. Then they started throwing um, a barbecue every time there was a PTA meeting. That immediately quadrupled the number of parents that showed up. And then they got adults involved from the church. By the end of the first year, 318 of them to do one on one tutoring with the kids. Not as a one year commitment, but as an ongoing commitment. Within two or three years, I forgot the exact figure, the school which had been registered on the sort of desperate standard, maybe would have to be closed, was already back within normal statistical ranges. And then the church, knowing that not many churches were big enough to repeat what they had done, started organizing smaller churches in the area to band together so that several churches together would adopt the school. That's quietly going on now, several years later. So far, I don't know how, this is the miraculous part of it. So far, under, without, without the, the glare of the ACLU on it or something like that, I mean, it, it could be shut down by a legal challenge, I'm sure. And it's, it's not that they're going in there and preaching the gospel, but they're all Christians going in. But you've got to understand, this is not the only stuff that Second Press does. This is an evangelistic church that is square on the gospel, is running university missions and local colleges, is seeing people converted regularly and so on. Do you see? But it's the overflow of doing the 12 people, especially those of the household of faith, while not losing sight for an instant of what the gospel is and what it is not. So Tim Keller, whose name you will know, up until now, uh, Redeemer Press in New York City, has been with that building, they just decided to move that way. They rent one whole floor of a skyscraper for their office space, and then they have met in theaters and other halls around Central Park for the years. But they realize now that, you know, Tim getting older, transition's coming, and they're going to have to do something about that. So they've gone after their first book. And with the square footage costs in a place like New York, that's not easy to do. But they've landed on their first book. You know what building they chose? Purposely? Partly under the influence of Sandy down in Memphis? A whopping big old building that has to be rejuvenated right next to the toughest meanest school in America. But my reason for telling these stories is not to hold either Tim or Sandy up to some superstar status. They're not. You know what they are? They're God's school preachers. And they're wise enough also to understand that such ministries shouldn't come directly under the leadership of the local church. Don't forget in the book of Acts, when there's already some social problem within the church of who's getting a fair distribution of food and so on, the apostles were very quick to say, listen, we are primarily committed to the ministry of the word and prayer, but these things have to be addressed. So let's appoint some others to handle this and this and this and this. 
You see, if this comes directly under the ministry of the local church, then Tim Keller's got to run it, directly or indirectly. You get Tim Keller doing that, and you won't be doing what he is doing. Namely, proclaiming the gospel and seeing people converted by their thousands of them. But nevertheless, he displays genial oversight. It is raising up leaders to take on this and this and this and this and this. Parallel 501c3s and all kinds of things with their leaders connected with the church, being taught by the church, but not confusing the proclamation of the gospel that saves and the nature of the church as a new community of the redeemed, of the justified, of the regenerated, with nevertheless the need to do good to all people, especially those of the household. Okay. In other words, it is really important to understand that the issue is not whether or not we should do good deeds. For anybody above, except the most obtuse, that's not an issue. The issue is how you configure the undergirding structure of thought. It's not just a theoretical matter. It's whether your undergirding structure of thought for justifying and explaining this and working it all out is square with scripture in such a way that holy uh, scripture is preserved in its integrity and the gospel itself remains the gospel and does not become something it is. At the level of our hearts, what this looks like in practice includes things like this. Number one, what do you dream about? What's of central importance to you? What are you passionate about? What are you desperate for? What do you pray over? Now it's right that we should be praying for some ministry of outreach amongst orphans or dealing with some social justice issue, regardless of what it is. It's right. It's right. But on the other hand, if that's what you do and never pray for the conversion of a lost person in your own family or who's attending your church or a neighbor, <coughs> God have mercy on your soul. Second, it also has a bearing on your use of time. You see, if you become so consumed with a genuine physical need that you don't have time anymore for reading, thinking, <coughs> praying, or ever talking about Jesus to anyone. But you feel you don't have to because you're doing gospel ministry. You're not. You flipped out of the Great Awakening and into 1880 to 1930. That's what you've done, de facto. Third, it will also have a bearing on whom you influence. I have been teaching enough decades now that I have learned that most students don't learn what I teach them. <laughs> they learn only a small part of what I teach them. You know the part that they learn? They learn what I'm excited about. They learn what I keep reiterating because I view it as excited and central. So if you get to the place where, yes, you're orthodox, you do believe the gospel, God bless you. But what you're talking about all the time, what you're excited about, what you're talking up, what you're devoting energy and money and priority to all the time is some social issue. Then your students won't even assume the gospel. They'll focus all of their attention on that issue. You see, one of the great strengths of the evangelical awakening is, as I've said, despite the film, People like Wilberforce and the Countess of Huntington and a whole slew of others who really were used of God to transform the social face of Britain. They really were. But they were gospel <coughs> people through and through and through and through. And they kept standing the new generation of those actually central pieces. And within that framework, they, they did do a lot of good. But they were concerned to keep what was central, central. Precisely, not only for their own sake, but for the sake of the standing of the next generation. Two more, along the lines of what we try to do then in the uh, Theological Vision of Ministry uh, document, it is wise and important to address relief of suffering. 
but put it on an entire scale, a relief of suffering both in this life and in the life to come. In fact, when we were thrashing out these documents in the Coalition Council, trying to get it right, trying to be faithful in Scripture, we got it all here, and then somebody said at the end, he said, okay, we've tried to be careful, but how in practice, on the street, do we preserve a gospel focus in our ministry and our priority and so on that nevertheless reaches out? How do we manage that? How, how, how do we do that? And various suggestions were put forth. Make sure you watch your heart. Make sure you're reading and rereading the Bible itself. And on and on and on. All those things were mentioned. And then one <coughs> member who is known to be somewhat crustier to the point that some of the other Bible members of Moses simply sat there and said, preach hell. He said, I, I, I beg your pardon? <laughs> and he said, preach hell. He said, because that will be a pretty definitive test on whether you are really interested in relieving suffering for time and eternity, or you're really just interested in minimizing suffering now, which I already believe in hell, and therefore you don't really need a savior who saves you. Then he smirked. He said, besides, if you preach hell, those who are into only the social gospel won't want to have anything to do with you. <laughs> and there's some truth to that, too. There is. And, and if you knew him and his church, I won't tell you his name, if you knew him and his church, you would know that he is very concerned with, with all kinds of outreach programs in his own city and so forth. But nevertheless, he is also concerned to think through how is it that you preserve what the apostle himself calls the matters of first importance. Final reflection. When you speak of the transformation of self and society, you have to ask what you mean by that. Transformation of self, how does that come about in the New Testament? Often, it, it, the gospel is configured this way. The gospel is what sort of tips you into Jesus it tips you into getting saved. It tips you into being uh, justified. It, it tips you in so that you're okay. You've got your escape a, a ticket out of, out, of, uh, out of the lake of burning sulfur. And then the transformation of stuff after that is basically a matter of learning obedience and discipleship courses and, and all, all that kind of thing. Isn't, isn't that the way a lot of us have inherited this business of transforming self? That is so far removed from the New Testament view of sanctification and growth that it's pathetic, even though it's Pretty common in evangelicalism. In the New Testament, the gospel is not the good news about how you can be justified, and then after that comes a whole lot of moralism that actually transforms you. The gospel in the New Testament is the big category. It's the big category. Not the little category that gets you justified, and after that comes all the big category about discipleship. It's the big category that talks about what God has done, not only to forgive us, but to transform us. It, it, that's why the Holy Spirit is given. That's why when Paul prays for believers, for example, he prays that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead may be operative in your inner being by the Holy Spirit to bring you into increased conformity to Christ. And the motives that he gives for this or that behavior are rarely to do with simple rules. He doesn't say, oh, don't fornicate, because after all, the law says don't fornicate. He says, how on earth can you think of fornicating when you have been a couple of times tied to Christ Jesus? He, he's yours. You, you, you've been bought. How, how can you betray him? It's a gospel appeal. And, and when you understand how the gospel works, the, the gospel doesn't come to you and say, okay, you've been saved. Now you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that. Never, never drink, smoke, swear, or chew, and never go with the girls that do. And that, that's how to be sanctified. That, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel comes along and says, this is what God has done. Isn't it spectacular? Here there is not only forgiveness, but He breaks the power of cancer sin. He does by a spirit in this way. And in the light of all that He has done, now you're working to the effects of the gospel. In the light of all that He has done, the only appropriate response is humility, trust, obedience, holy joy that transforms your life and everyone you touch.
The gospel, you see, is the big category. Not the little one that just gets you in by the skin of your teeth. And that's the basis, then, for the transformation that generates not only a transformed individual, but the transformed community of the church. A community of transformed individuals. That's a gospel thing. Then when you start talking about the transformation of the broader culture, then you're along two or three more axes that you need to think about. In terms of doing good, of helping out in this particular arena or that particular arena, doing some good, whether it's the school system in Memphis, or tackling children down the mines in 1780 Great Britain, or any other social problem that you care to address, such that there is some sort of transformation <coughs> of the culture because Christians and others have rolled up their sleeves and begun to do some important things. Then in that sense, there certainly can be some transformation of culture that takes place in particular times and circumstances. On the other hand, it is important, it is important to remember that that must not be set up as an absolute good. How are you going to convince believers in the underground church in Saudi Arabia that it's part of their job to transform the culture? The authorities even know you're a Christian and you're a Saudi, you're beheaded. That's it. No questions asked. You're done. Which, which is why, by and large, in the New Testament, where Paul himself finds himself under the Roman authority, which was, after all, not a democratic society voting every 4th November. What under Nero? Not even a benevolent, benevolent this law. Certainly not a constitutional monarch, a dictator, and a cruel and bloody-minded one, too. In that framework, he almost never talks about transforming society. He talks rather about the church, how the church is different from society. And within that framework, doing good and being faithful and show honor to all people, honor to him, respect to brother, all those kinds of things. Yes, yes, yes. And the Bible can still talk about being salt and light in the dark and corrupt in the world. Yes, yes, yes. But the very fact that we can talk about transforming society reflects the fact that we live under democracies of one sort or another where we have more direct access to strings of power. And let's be quite frank, if the tide of culture goes against us, we might find that the kinds of things that we want to do are, are against us, and we are simply marginalized increasingly. And then the question becomes not so much how to transform the culture, but what sort of delaying actions we can do, or what sort of things we can do at, at the soft end of individual projects and local municipalities and this sort of thing. Even while the tide of history turns against us, it could, even in democracy, turn all the way to persecution. Don't kid yourself. It could. Because unless you are a strong and dogmatic post-millennialist, the aim of the Christian is not the transformation of society. You still do good and you try to do as much good as you can, which includes some transformation of local units and all. But at the end of the day, the Bible makes it pretty clear that on the last day, why is the gate and many of you that don't go to the internet to instruction? I have no hope of saving all the culture. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not supposed to be doing what I can and, and saving it, not only in the sense of preaching the gospel and seeing people converted and taken out of it to constitute a new countercultural community, but also doing good, but, but as in the Great Awakening. But at the same time, the power that actually transforms individuals, transforms men and women, and it reaches out through the needs to touch broader society and so on, must not be seen as the kind of ultimate aim, unless you are of the post-millennial variety of theologian, and then we're on to another topic that I can begin to I see. Now, I've rambled it on too long, but unless you've got a class, you want to raise a few questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Then I'm supposed to see some more students in the Questions of personal views? You said on a practical level, I don't mean to be cautious about how we use our time. Yeah. What would you say to a person who's primarily gifted, not in preaching or teaching, but <coughs> mercy or service ministries? Yes, and it may be that some are called vocational to work with Alzheimer's. I have no problem with that. 
But on the other hand, even that person uh, is going to have be talking to non-Christians and whether it's on. What do they naturally talk about? They talk about their faith, how they were converted, what the cross means to them, how how how, how Christ means to save people. Did they ever share their faith? Did they ever try to lead anybody to Jesus? Oh, well, I don't know. That's one way of saying it. I'm not denying that there might be some people who are particularly uh, who got the job of uh, doing something in Jesus or something. I'm, I'm not denying that. But the thing to check out at the heart level is. Does that person now think that because they're doing the job of doing that only oh, so true? You did. That therefore they are doing gospel ministry and they have no obligation to share their faith or talk about who Jesus is or what he's done about. Check the heart of it. And that's why I can't make it a legalistic thing. Well, so long as you do it three times a month. I mean, that's just more moralism. You know what that does? It's a heart issue where you're right it's at. Uh, forgive me for my ignorance, but how did the stereotype that somehow conservative Christians are a lot less concerned with social work come into place, and how do we get on so Well, the reason it came into place is because there is at least a little truth to it. And it was truer in the divide that took place between modern so-called, fundamentalist so-called, between roughly 1880 and 1930. But if you actually take a look, if you take a look at even conservative uh, admission organizations, SIN, things like that, you take a look at all the kinds of things that they're doing. Uh, well, they have people planting churches and teaching theology, but they also have people digging wells and uh, medical doctors. Do you know, where, where does this bifurcation come from? They, they did that in the 1940s, or 1950s, or 1960s, or 1970s. Plus the figures that I gave you from Acton Institute in the UK. So it's part of a stereotype, because so often we like to justify where we are by saying we're not like them, and we're not like them, we're good here. And whenever we make those bifurcations, always we end up in the best place, don't we? That's why there's always a temptation for self-promotion that way. There are bad guys over there, bad guys over there. Henry Kissinger says that in his book, The White House Seeds, too. He says, the Secretary of State comes into power. And, and he's supposed to be leading the troops, but all the professional ones. Um, uh, he says to them on some issue, uh, Pongo, Pongo, what do we do about this? And inevitably, the professionals come back and say, well, there are twits on the left, there are twits on the right, and there are wise forces here. And, and thus, inevitably, you, you, you see he's, he's, he's forced into a position that is judged to be uh, superior. And we can do that by recasting our own history. Well, the liberals got it wrong, the conservatives got it wrong. We got it right. Uh, avoid the attitude like the play. It, just, it, it isn't really all that true, it's not helpful in any So, if I hear you a different way when you start talking, but I think what you're saying is that if, if you're a church or a Christian organization, there's no problem with being involved in a social justice ministry where the gospel, quotation marks, cannot be presented as long as you don't call that gospel ministry, but you still want us to be involved in those ministries, or else we would be, I guess, fundamentalists in that regard of separation. Well, even a lot of fundamentalists. Actually, I'm more heavily involved in social ministries than you realize. Uh, but quite apart from that, I, I would say that if you have a choice, let's say you've got a choice between working with two institutions, one that ties you very, very, very tightly <coughs> in a counseling situation in a hospital or in a school district, never, ever, ever to mention anything about religion, and certainly don't mention the word Jesus. You might mention Islam once or twice, but nothing else. <laughs> Or working in the schools, doing the same sort of mentoring situation with uh, another sort of organization where you can be yourself. You're not, you're not having to proselytize every time you're reading those, but you can be yourself and, 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 and so on. If I had to choose between those two, boy, I know which one I want to be with. But at the same time, even beyond those sorts of choices, then I still want to say, um, so you're going into the school office when you check in and you're talking to a principal or whatever. Of course it's appropriate to talk about it. You don't ever talk about your faith to anybody. And how are you being obedient to the Great Commission? It's there. Some people said we don't even want you to do that if you don't have the opportunity to do that. I guess that's kind of a hypothetical. It is a hypothetical. Usually there are opportunities in any case. But, but uh, or there are parallel organizations you can do the same ministry with or something like that. And even if you know, hypothetical, you really can't do it in that particular matrix. You've got to be other matrices in your life when you are doing it. But again, you're going to test yourself by right? out of your heart, out of the rules. Okay. Can you talk about how 
this relates to preaching in regards to the, you talk about how preaching hell, and then there are those that say, well, you only preach Christ, and everything that you're going to preach has to relate to Christ, and those who say, well, no, I can preach on these issues, and I don't necessarily have to mention Christ in that way. Uh, how that kind of question. Yeah, um, you do, if you're, if you're a preacher, uh, want to preach the whole things of God, which means not only preach, well, you, you use categories of Lutheran in that view. That means there is a place where right to preaching law as well as preaching gospel. If you ask the Puritans what's in the Bible, they would have said law, gospel, and illustrations of both. But thus they're making a distinction. They're not saying that everything that is mandated by the Bible is gospel. Now, I think there are far more sophisticated ways of analyzing what's in the Bible. Only if you're going to preach the whole counsel of God, in some sense, you have to preach the Bible. But then you come back to the issue that I was trying to make as my main point. You come back to then what is the pattern of sound teaching. That is, what is the nature of the structure of thought in the Bible? It's how you integrate this together. So there are some preachers I know who believe the Bible is the word of God, uh, but they have no idea how it hangs together. So they find a text here and they preach, and it sounds basically gospel related. And another sermon over here has something to do with social justice. There's another one over here that and, and in no sense does it hang together. It, it, it doesn't hold together. And, and if you ask what their priorities are, or how it's configured, or what is the summation of all things, or where the glory of God fits in this, they don't have a blessed clue. They don't know anything about the pattern of the sound. They don't know how the Bible is put together. So what I would want to say is that even when you're preaching Isaiah 2, or Amos, both social justice, or, or um, um, the parable of the Good Samaritan, or Galatians 6, and doing good to all men, especially those that have so faith, and making applications and this sort of thing, those sorts of sermons based on genuine biblical texts that do make those points, still, like every sermon based on any biblical text, needs to be integrated into the theme of the book in question, which needs to be integrated into the canon, which inevitably brings you in one fashion or another the centrality of Christ. It just does. Now, I, I can only begin to unpack that in the beginning of a couple of hours. But when I teach homiletics, I don't, they don't let me do it here in my life. When I teach on that then I spend a lot of time showing that expository preaching is not only explaining what a text says in its pity locality, but faithful expository preaching is also showing from that busy text its inner canonical connections to the great tendons that run right through scripture that bring you the centrality of Jesus. That makes for powerful world viewers preaching. And then you can make a point of the big text that is rightly configured in the whole council of God. But how to do that? I can't answer. Yeah. Uh, I know there are certain areas or countries where um, in the world that where an diluted uh, proclamation of the gospel is not possible, and the only way uh, to get in contact for missionaries to get in contact with their people is through the the soft gospel ministry or or like other um, can be can make her those uh, like such work. So do you see um, and later on when they build a good reputation and the government might allow them to more room to do their ministry, do you see this an uh, inevitable process or a, a progress being not being broken? Yes. I mean the, 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 it would be a mistake to think that the only legitimate way of making the gospel known is preaching in a kind of public environment. There is a huge centrality in the New Testament in public preaching and teaching, but nevertheless, public preaching and teaching in the New Testament is a subset of a bigger category of what might be called the ministry of the word. So if you have people going not to, let's say, the free economic zones of China, but working inland, where there's often a lot more pressure than this sort of thing, they start a factory somewhere, uh, up near the Mongolian border or something, where things are a lot tighter. Um, um, there is a context in which you're nevertheless building relationships, uh, friendships. You're in a home, and you start, and, and you're a Christian, what does that mean? Who is this Jesus? And, and then you're starting to explain what the Bible is, and that too is part of gospel proclamation, not in the sense of public display or public voice or lecturing, having a microphone, but it is part of the ministry of the word, and it is part of the honesty and integrity of sharing your faith with others in order to make central Jesus and all that he's done, all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus and so on. That's still gospel faithfulness. So within that framework, if you're also doing good by starting a business in an area where there's an economic down in the country and all of that, that's great, that's great, why not? 
So um, I, I, don't, I don't see any problems with those, so long as the Christian who's doing it does not lose the centrality of the richness of the gospel itself. And if there are political holds on how much can be done publicly, then all the more creativity is going to go on what can be done privately. But it's still part of the ministry of the word. I think I better. Yeah. Well, could you all thank me and join me? Thank you. Thank you.